All right, let's dive into chapter two. So we talked about the talent flow in chapter one, about recruiting highly talented people, developing them, knowing how they perform, then you retain the high performers and quickly remove low performers. Here we'll be discussing the second step in more detail about developing this talent quickly and effectively. The first framework we'll walk through is the skill will matrix. So first of all, most companies believe their top talent, the executives at these companies, they, they don't have enough top talent. They recognize this, this isn't an unknown. And so the response of some organizations is, well, let's just recruit the best people. Let's recruit the best people. And then we fill them in these critical roles and then we win. Well, that's, that's not going to work, and it's not going to work for a number of reasons. The first reason is that there's frequently not enough people in the market to fill those critical roles. I mean, frequently that's the case. The second is that your organization is different in some critical aspects than most other companies. And even if you have someone walk in the door who is competent and knows what they're doing, there's going to need to be further development within your own company that applies to your own company's culture, industry, function, and organization. The third point is that skills become stale or obsolete, and that's becoming ever more important to, in today's environment. And so just to stay in place, it's like we're on a treadmill, we have to keep moving just to stay where we are, never, never mind pulling ahead in front of others. And so here's the skill will matrix very straightforward. It's a very basic framework, but despite it being super basic, it's, it's something to keep in mind and it's incredibly useful. Now, obviously quadrant one is the goal. You want those with high skill and high will. They know what they're doing. They want to succeed and they're moving forward. However, most people, they don't just fall into one quadrant. They're constantly drifting. And they're constantly drifting because they're put in different situations, different environments, different levels of skill are required for different types of responsibilities. And so they're constantly shifting. And so another trap that people fall into is say, well, let's just get rid of the people who aren't in quadrant one. Well, even your top performers are drifting away from quadrant one frequently, depending on the environment, the responsibilities, and the team that they're, they're, that they're working with. So what can you do about this? Well, of course, it's motivate, increase expectations. And if you want to push will, it's, it's removing this limited mindset. You need to show and demonstrate that they can accomplish more. So most people, many people don't realize this, is that most, most employees don't want to suck. They don't. They, they want to be all-stars. They want to be big hitters. However... They might not be in the position or don't feel that they're in the position that they can actually accomplish this. They, they're maintaining a limited mindset, partially maybe because of the environment, because of manager expectations. And so pushing someone's will is more plausible than what most people realize. The second is with, with skill is that it's easy to become discouraged if you don't have the skill set, that skill and will are actually linked. If you really, really want to succeed, but you just fail over and over and over because you don't have the training, you're going to get demotivated. So it's thinking in both these dimensions simultaneously of skill and will that can help push your organization to quadrant one. And the last thing to keep in mind is that skill is a loose term. There are skills that are interpersonal, cognitive, how well do they work with a team? Or there could be technical, there could be programming skills. And if you think in these loose terms of skill and also will, you can recognize, one, you can recognize where you are at any given moment on any given day and how you can push yourself and push your team to quadrant one. So now you're pumped up and ready to go and to drive your organization to quadrant one with high skill and high will. So what's the current landscape for talent development? Well, the vast majority of leaders want a drastic change in how their organizations develop its employees. This doesn't mean that they're not trying to develop their employees. It means they want a drastic change in how it's being done. So just a few facts. Um, only about a fifth of employees report getting on the job training in the past five years. It's a huge time frame. Virtually very few employees report getting on the job training. 
And coupled with that, less than 50% of employees feel their leaders foster development. Now, some leaders may say, oh, but we've provided this, this online classroom training, we've provided OSHA training, we did sexual harassment training, and so we're providing this training and development. But on the employee side, they don't feel this. Some of these trainings might be classroom only and they don't feel engaged. And other trainings, say OSHA or some of these other types of trainings, these are for, for hygiene factors. You have to have these trainings. But this isn't the training that's going to transform you into a heavy hitter. This isn't going to tr transform you into an all-star. And on top of this, as was previously mentioned, increasing technological change is speeding up the treadmill. We must run faster and faster just to stay in place. So this technological change is making this specialized knowledge obsolete and we need to keep going faster and faster and faster in order to avoid being left in the dust. And that brings us to the 70-20-10 model. And the 70-20-10 model is fairly straightforward. It's simply 70% of training is on the job training, 20% is mentoring and coaching, and 10% is in online or in a classroom setting. So of these three, which one of the, them do you prefer? Now the vast majority of us, I believe, answer on the job training. It's tactile, we see the change that occurs. We have the freedom to make mistakes and learn along the way. On the job training, it's, it's motivating and useful. I once had the opportunity to uh, working on a project to work with an order to cash specialist. Now this order to cash specialist was very, very, very good of the order to cash process, which is the moment that a customer makes an order all the way to the moment that the customer pays us. So it's all of the backend processes and financial processes associated with that. I spent three days with the equivalent of an all-star and I learned more in those three days than two semesters worth of classes on order to cash processes had I taken those. It was an incredible experience for me and it was also motivating. I wanted to become incredibly good because this person was demonstrating what competence and mastery actually looks like. So think about your organization. In terms of quantity and quality, what do you see in on-the-job training? Do you see the quantity there of on-the-job training? What's the level of quality like? Then also with mentoring and coaching, people think mentoring and coaching fre frequently is, you know, what do you want to accomplish in your life and what are your career goals? Very, very broad based, which is, which is fine to an extent, but a lot of mentoring and coaching is outlining just like a regular coach for a sports team. What skills do you need to work on? Let's work on those skills and keep reporting back to see if you're getting better. It's a different type of mentoring and coaching than what many people have in their minds. And of course, classroom and online has its place. It's very effective in terms of its niches, but it shouldn't be what should be wholly relied on for your training model. Now, no matter where you are in your organization, there are certain things that you can apply today. And in this section, um, the, the book refers to making things personal. And it refers to the, the four stages of competence, or sometimes called the four stages of learning model, where as you're learning something, first of all, you're unconsciously incompetent. You're unaware that you're bad at something. And then you transition to, once you have that awareness, you transition to being consciously incompetent. You know that you do not know what you're doing. With training, you can get to being consciously competent, that if you really try at it, you can get the job done. From there, with continued guided practice, you can get to the point where you're unconsciously competent and then you can excel at it without even thinking. You can execute on that. You can do, an, say, an order to cash process. You could design it and improve it. You've done it enough times that it's become second nature to you. Now, in most respects and in most activities that you're doing, you, you are not in the unconsciously competent category. I am not. None of us are. Most things that we do, we're not unconsciously competent at everything we do and everything we touch. We just need to recognize it. That's fine, but it just needs to be recognized. And this recognition can actually occur as a part of the company culture. 
And what this drives, this drives continuous improvement of recognizing we're not all at that level, not even most of us. It's very, very few of us, and we need to continue to excel. It's this repetition versus iteration mindset. Now, what's repetition? Repetition is doing the same thing over and over and over again. Now, what about iteration? Iteration's different from repetition. Iteration means you do it once, and the results of how you've done your first loop makes it so you make changes in the next iteration. You're learning iteratively. You're, you're changing every time you're going through. And so think of these, th look at these two phrases. My job is to do my best, or is it my job is to always get better? Which of those sounds more fun? Which of those sounds more fulfilling? Which of those two mindsets within an organization, if, if that was the culture of two different organizations, which organization would you bet on to succeed? I would bet on the organization that's focusing on always trying to improve and get better. So you're now focusing on transforming your organization to continually improve and improve and improve. You're thinking iteratively now. Now there's a few things to keep in mind. One is that we focus primarily on our strengths. Now that's for a couple of reasons. The first is that focusing on weaknesses, it's, it's not very fun. It can be demoralizing. It can lower where you are on will if you're just doing weaknesses over and over and over and over. Now, shoring up critical weaknesses, that, that's important. However, you're going to have more success when you're focusing on your, stre on your strengths. Now, a critical weakness that, that overshadows any strengths, yes, that needs to be worked on. But when you focus on strengths, what happens is that when you work on a team, every individual can bring their strengths to the team until you create a very strong team by each one focusing on your strengths. And this is interesting because what we know is that a well-rounded team member might not be quite as effective as someone who's, say, spiky rather than well-rounded. Spiky as in they have a handful of very, very strong strengths. They're uniquely strong in certain categories, and they can add that value to your team. And so you can couple individuals with certain skills together and create an all-star team out of it. Now, one great example that I like is uh, Richard Branson. He's admitted in multiple interviews that he's, he's not great at financial statements. That may shock and surprise you. That is not his strong suit. Now, he's a world-class performer in promoting and embodying a brand that that's his world-class performance talent now he's going to need to hire and has hired brilliant and effective financial managers so that the financial state so that the financial statements can be properly incorporated into the firm's strategy and he listens for that input and he's able to compensate for that weakness and that's fine and so how do you improve these strengths that you have? Well, there's, there's a lot of literature out there. Strengths Finder is one of the most popular books. But a quick and more concise rundown on improving your strengths is fundamentally focusing on stretch targets. Now, a stretch target, you need to move slightly out of your comfort zone and achieve what you've never achieved before. And by doing that iteratively, it's not repetition, it's iteration. You continue to learn and progress and learn and progress and learn and progress. And what I'd like you to think about is the difference between, say, a 90th percentile performer and a 99.9th percentile performer and a world-class Olympic performer. Now take something like, say, teaching. Take someone who's a 90th percentile performer at teaching. Now they're, they're, you know, they're better than nine out of every 10 people out there teaching. That's, that's great. That's good. What about someone who's achieving 99.9th percentile? So it's, there's better than 999 out of every thousand people who are out there. So how do you get from say average to 90th and then 90th from 99.9th and then 99.9th to say world-class Olympic performer, one of the 15 greatest people at that skill say in the world? Well, each one of these levels involves stretch targets. It involves basically putting on more weight, having the right instruction and the right feedback 
and putting you into different and new contexts. And by doing this, you're reinforcing your strength and you're able to move up this ladder. And it isn't sufficient just to say reinforce your strengths because a lot of us, well, we're average in a lot of things. We're, we're not quite sure what those strengths are yet. Well, in order to establish those new strengths, it's, it's mutual learning and exposure. It's not just the stretch situations, but coupling stretch situations with those who do know what they're doing who can instruct us or like the order to cash example. It was, is this something, is an order to cash manager, that skill set? is that something that I could be amazing in? Well, I had no context of this or no idea that this could potentially become a strength until I was with someone who was very, very good at it. And they were able to instruct me and show me on what that world-class performance actually looks like. And so through continually establishing these stretch targets and then achieving them, getting feedback, you'll be able to move up from average to 90th, 90th to 99.9th, and potentially as a world-class performer. Let's recap chapter two then. First, the skill will framework is incredibly useful, very simplistic, but incredibly useful. Your teams need both the skill and the will in order to succeed and thrive. Second, Senior managers recognize this. I mean, many of all of us know this to some degree that talent development is generally lacking across all types of organizations. And so, what can be done? One of the most fundamental shifts is focusing on the 70 20 10 model. That if we shift this training and development that occurs on the job, that would dramatically change the development that's actually occurring. Instead of once every five years you're getting on the job training should be once every month, once every two months, once every week, depending on the position in the organization. Lastly, make continuous improvement personal. Make it personal to your organization. And on top of this, focus on strengths in order to create st stars, in order to create spiky individuals that have many strengths that can be coupled with other individuals with many strengths in order to create all-star world-class performing teams.